Um, hi, I'm Dr. Joanne Kurtzberg, I'm Director of the Pediatric Blood Marrow Transplant Program at Duke University Medical Center. I also direct the Carolinas Cord Blood Bank at Duke, which is a public cord blood banking facility, um, and the Stem Cell Laboratory at Duke, which supports the transplant patients in our program. Bone marrow or stem cell transplantation can be used to help a lot of patients with many different diagnoses. In pediatrics, um, children with resistant cancer, particularly cancers of the blood and the immune system, can often only be cured by a bone marrow or stem cell transplant. I think what's most interesting about pediatrics is, though, that there are a series of genetic diseases that affect the blood forming system or the immune system, or sometimes even diseases that affect uh, development of the brain that can also be treated with a stem cell transplant. The blood forming diseases examples would be aplastic anemia or sickle cell anemia or thalassemia, all of which are fatal diseases over childhood without treatment. Um, in the immune system, it would be like the bubble boy disease or severe combined immune deficiency, which again is fatal in childhood. And then in, in children with metabolic diseases, um, uh, diseases like adrenal leukodystrophy, if anyone's read the book or seen the movie Lorenzo's Oil. Um, they're diseases that affect how the brain is myelinated. And when you do a transplant early in the course of those diseases, you can rescue the child from the devastating effects of the disease. I think the next um, big advance in medicine will involve using cells as therapy. And we are learning from these children how to do that. Today, when we treat a child with one of these diseases with a bone marrow transplant, we have to give them very, very high doses of chemotherapy or radiation therapy um, to kill their own bone marrow and to lower their immune system so their body doesn't reject the cell. If we had a way to get cells to grow inside a child without having to give them such high doses of chemotherapy or radiation, we would be able to sort of have our cake and eat it too. We'd be able to correct their disease without putting them at such great risk. But right now, I have to use the high doses of chemotherapy or radiation in order to get cells to grow to give these ch children a chance at life. Suzanne has a method which I believe will work and which allows um, us to get the cells to engraft or grow in the child without having to expose them to such high doses of chemotherapy or other treatments. So if Suzanne's method can carry over to some of the diseases that I treat, um, we'll be able to cure these children and spare them all the consequences of chemotherapy, both at the time of the transplant and many years later. You know, one of the things about treating children is that you not only have to worry about saving their life, but you have to worry about what they're going to be like 20, 30, 40, year, 40 years later. And you might look at that as a luxury when you're first curing a disease, but then later you really want them to be okay and you don't want them to have some late consequence of the therapy that you had to give them. Let me start by talking about what a transplant is like today in the way that I have to do it. They have a hospitalization that can be as long as 60 to 70 days at probably about $3,000 a day when you add up all the different things they need, medicines, transfusions, and nursing care, et cetera. And then they have a period of another six months or so where they have to stay in the vicinity of the transplant center to continue to come to a um, kind of day hospital clinic where they get other infusions and they get monitored very carefully and they have to take many expensive medications. In contrast with Suzanne's regimen, um, I really think patients won't have to be in the hospital at all. Um, or if they do, it'll be just for a few days. The average patient I treat needs 70 transfusions. Um, the likelihood that that a patient on her study will need a, tr a transfusion at all is very low, or they might need one, at two, one or two at most. They don't have to take as many of the medicines that patients getting the full um, transplant have to take for nine to 12 months. I can't give you the exact numbers, but I would expect that this would cut the costs um, by probably um, two thirds. Right now, we need to have a full match in the family in order to do a successful transplant. And a full match is only available in one in four children. With Suzanne's approach, three out of four children would have a match because you could use a half matching family member. If you could use a donor from the family most of the time, which is what Suzanne's therapy enables, then these people would get to transplant and they would not you know, have to wait or deteriorate. I'm very hopeful about this collaboration. I'm excited about it, too, because I think it's going to allow us to take a, a very important step uh, with the therapy, um, which is to make it available to more patients and safer.
One of the major problems patients with sickle cell face is that they're not transplanted as young children when they're relatively healthy and the disease hasn't taken its toll. Um, they get sicker as they get older, and when they're young adults, they have many manifestations of the disease, which is going to shorten their lifespan. But at that point, they can't go through a traditional transplant. They're too sick to tolerate it. And Suzanne's therapy provides a way to give them a transplant, um, giving them a donor in their family, as well as a less toxic approach to getting the cells to grow. The costs to take care of a patient with sickle cell vary based on that patient's um, clinical status. So many children with sickle cell have repeated pain crises or more serious chest crises or sometimes strokes, which bring them back and forth to the hospital many times a year. Thalassemia is a genetic disease where children are born um, with a mutation that affects the way they make hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is the protein in red cells that helps them carry oxygen. And when children have full-blown thalassemia, they can't make blood effectively, and they become profoundly anemic as infants and um, require transfusions essentially for life. And the typical child with thalassemia has to get transfused every three to four weeks, um, and that never goes away. You can be exposed to hepatitis and other viruses that are traveling in the blood, and sometimes they can affect um, the liver or other organs and cause very serious life-threatening infections. And this is probably the most important, is that children on chronic transfusions build up iron in their body. And the iron, over a couple of decades, deposits in their liver, their heart, their brain, um, and other organs, and causes those organs to fail. And so you can have a perfectly healthy teenager with thalassemia who's been on transfusion since they're six months old suddenly die in their sleep of a heart arrhythmia because iron has been in the, in the heart muscle. And that's not an uncommon story. Um, you're talking about spending sixty dollars to $100,000 per year on that patient for their whole life. On the other hand, if you transplant a child with thalassemia, particularly when they're young, um, you eliminate their need for a transfusion. You eliminate the iron overload. You don't expose them to viruses that can be transmitted through the blood. Their growth and development becomes normal, and they're overall healthy individuals. The cost of a transplant is, is high, probably one to $200,000, but it's a one-time layout, if you will, and then you've invested in a healthy future for that patient. You know, I think there are several stages to bringing a new therapy to the clinic, if you will. And the first stage is to demonstrate that it works. Um, and in the case of this therapy, we have to show cells will grow back, even though we're giving much less therapy. And also that when we use a haplo or a half-matched donor, we won't get an increase in something called graft-versus-host disease. Um, if we can show both of those things in roughly 40 patients, then we can take it to a bigger trial in multiple centers. That usually um, requires another 100 or so patients. And then from that point on, it should become standard of care. Suzanne's protocol is a relatively easy protocol to export. And one thing that's very nice, and we're demonstrating that here at Duke, is that we can gather the cells, send them to her. She can um, do her um, selection and then send them back to us. And the patient is fine. The cells are fine. And we can transplant them from after they've been processed remotely. And that's very important for exporting this technology to other centers because the main expertise can be um, sequestered in one center, but the actual treatment of the patient can be done locally. I don't think people realize, but, but um, even when the government funds a clinical trial, they rarely fund the actual trial or the patient care costs or the, the, the monies for the patient to get the treatment and be in the hospital. Nobody wants to fund that middle piece when something is new. You're kind of stuck in the middle when you really want to start something new and innovative. So philanthropic support will pay those initial patient costs that can't be covered by the insurance until you prove it works. And you only need that for um, you know, a handful of patients, depending on how successful your therapy is. But that early step can't be done without phil philanthropy. For more information, please visit nfctr.org. Thank you.